Welcome to the Sager Briefing Vlog. My name is Gary Shaven. I'll be your host. Throughout 2022, we're featuring our partner and parent company, Dizan Shira and Associates, as they celebrate their 30th anniversary. Each month, we feature an equity partner, expert, or guest as they recount the firm's history to present day story and on the ground issues that companies face in today's thriving and rapidly developing Asia. In this clip, we welcome four guests, beginning with Dizan Shira's managing partner, Mr. Alberto Vetteretti. He kicks us off with a quick exploration through the firm's entry into the Indonesia market and international business climate there in terms of economy, key sectors, and regulatory environment. Hi, Alberto. Welcome back and thank you for joining. Dizan Shire has been established in Indonesia to serve its clients for several years now. Uh, what were the drivers behind entering the Indonesia market originally and how did the firm approach the strategic opportunity? Thanks for having me back, Gary. Uh, Indonesia has always been on the firm's radar screen and the drivers really that got our attention uh, back then and still today uh, are certainly the large amount of human capital available if you were to expand your manufacturing uh, capacity uh, in that country uh, and also the local consumer markets, which is uh, huge uh, or potentially so in a country which has close to 300 million people. Um, we've always been very um, uh, well connected to the manufacturing world and Indonesia, I remember back then, um, had manufacturing as part of GDP just hovering around 15%. Uh, uh, the new projections are for uh, manufacturing to reach about 20 or 25% of GDP in a few years time. So this is a huge push by the uh, local government. And uh, I think uh, for us, it's also an important opportunity uh, over there. Uh, Indonesia, I think, also has been very um, smart in terms of uh, pushing traditional manufacturing, but also jumping directly into the future of digitalizations and e-commerce. And, uh, and associating the two is really providing the, the good uh, ingredients and uh, really drive uh, the manufacturing uh, process into the, the future. Uh, many unicorns have also um, uh, developed in Indonesia, particularly in uh, uh, e-commerce. Uh, of course, Indonesia needs to service over 17,000 islands. So I think that provides quite, uh, quite a big challenge. And uh, e-commerce, of course, is, uh, is very important in, uh, um, in driving Indonesia into the, uh, into the future. Um, free trade agreements have been uh, uh, discussed by Indonesia, and I think um, there will be many up and coming, providing also additional opportunities for foreign companies uh, to use Indonesia as a hub to sell into other markets in the region and elsewhere. Uh, it seems that the firm selected a different entry strategy, perhaps for the Indonesia market, than it previously used for China, Vietnam, and India, which we've discussed previously. Why was this uh, change approach, uh, change in approach chosen? Um, some of the traditional markets, we um, went uh, head in and uh, we started to invest since uh, day one. Um, however, we realized um, many of our clients were not just a single country uh, invested. They were looking at multiple uh, countries approach. So we were at a point where we had to provide the same seamless solutions to our clients also in countries where we did not have a direct presence. So we started with, with the idea to uh, line up a few uh, partners in uh, um, other countries. Uh, and uh, we started a search for the right fit and the right partner uh, in terms of um, quality of service, uh, in terms of fast turnarounds um, uh, for our demanding clients, um, in terms of familiarity with technology, with platforms that the firm is, uh, is using and investing into, um, as well as dealing with foreign invested enterprises, really, which is the bread and butter of our, uh, our firm. Um, Last but not least, um, share vision for Asia in terms of growth and opportunity being based in the uh, in the region. So once we um, line up the right partner, then we uh, enter into partnership agreements uh, with them. And um, I think Indonesia was a typical case in point where we um, we have a local partner which we've been uh, working with for a number of years. Um, so 
having said that, we um, this year decided to um, invest directly into the country. Uh, Indonesia is interesting because the, the, the investment, the total investment is still quite high in terms of uh, doing business in the country. So we committed close to a million US dollar in terms of uh, uh, total investment. Um, so this means uh, we are very committed to the um, to the country. So while we're still uh, working together with our partners, we're developing some business units out of our own steam, and uh, those will grow uh, revenues in, in Indonesia in the years ahead. Hmm, fascinating. So as you, with this investment, as you eye Southeast Asia and the firm's objectives to grow in the region, uh, what role do you see Indonesia playing, say, over the next three to five years? I was having this conversation with a few clients recently, and uh, some of them there are starting to get a bit edgy about uh, potential uh, labor gluts in, in Vietnam, for example, or availability of labor, cost of labor. So they're really looking at, uh, okay, what's next? And I think that's the, the million dollars question in terms of what's next. I think Indonesia could play a role uh, in that regards, in terms of having um, really large uh, market um, for uh, manufacturing. Um, so Indonesia, I think, is very interesting in that uh, standpoint. Also to have an additional base in, uh, in ASEAN or Asia, uh, always to play into uh, China Plus um, uh, strategy uh, and moving from sort of in-country to multi-shoring or near-shoring uh, approach to um, play an important role into this disrupted uh, supply chain that we, uh, that we see these days. Um, last but not least, with our recent efforts into uh, uh, the Middle East, um, perhaps Indonesia could play an interesting role, being the largest uh, Muslim country in the world. So I think there could be interesting synergies uh, once we move into these new geographies for the firm. Well, fascinating. It seems like uh, Indonesia is answering part of the million dollar question. Uh, this Absolutely. Is this sets the stage to speak with our next guest, Marco Forster, regarding Indonesia's positioning in ASEAN as a destination for international business and about Desmond Shira's presence there in the market. Thank you very much for joining and for sharing these insights, Alberto. Thanks for having me. Welcome, Marco. Thank you for joining uh, today. It's clear that, uh, that ASEAN and Indonesia specifically are vital markets for Desmond Shira's Asia strategy. From your perspective as the firm's head of business development in ASEAN, how do you see Indonesia's positioning in terms of its economy and specific sectors compared with other countries in Southeast Asia? Well, Gary, thanks first of all for having me. And uh, Indonesia is a very important market right now, so that's a very important question to ask. And uh, the simple answer is uh, Indonesia is a giant and uh, not just compared to Southeast Asia, but also on a global scale. And um, already now, Indonesia's economy is the seventh largest in the world. And estimates say that by 2050, Indonesia will have surpassed um, Russia, Brazil, Germany and Japan to take on the fourth spot, which is just behind China, India and the US. And um, also when it comes to population size, Indonesia is already the fourth rank in the world. Um, but back to the second part of your question regarding the important sectors and so on, um, and how Indonesia differs from, from the other Southeast Asian countries, there are quite a few industries to mention. Um, again, it's a very big country with many ongoing infrastructure projects. And uh, in fact, the capital Jakarta is prone to the effects of climate change. And you oftentimes, oftentimes see uh, headlines in the news like Jakarta is sinking due to rising sea levels. And uh, the government has planned the relocation of the capital to Borneo Island. Um, and the construction of a newly planned city, which will be called Nusantara, should start um, right now, this month, and uh, also, of course, offers a lot of opportunities. Um, on another note, um, Indonesia is also the country with the most uh, Muslims in the world. So it's also the biggest uh, halal market, not just for food, but also uh, other sectors like Islamic finance. Um, and um, in reality, Indonesia's biggest industries can still be seen through the most important export commodities that Indonesia has, which are still oil and gas, coal, palm oil, electrical appliances, and I think also rubber products. And these exports also go mostly to China, the US, Japan, Singapore, and India, and I think also in that order. But um, I think what we will see 
uh, in our lifetime, or not only in our lifetime, I think within the next 10 years, is uh, that Indonesia will have a shift towards more sophisticated manufacturing and also services um, aided by FDI. Uh, and also accelerated by China-based FDI looking to move or diversify uh, their supply chains. And this will not only take the economy to the next level, but this also brings in much needed jobs and expertise um, for the country. And all in all, um, this contributes to FDI, of course, and uh, this is happening right now uh, because FDI was already surging 32% year on year just in Q1 this year. Which factors do you think most contribute to its attractiveness as an investment destination and as a prospect for international uh, businesses? Um, so Indonesia is attractive again because of its market size and also a big labor pool. And um, also Indonesia, similar to China and India, uh, should be taken seriously not only as a manufacturing location, for the world, um, but also as a key domestic market um, with a growing middle class and um, also subsequently um, purchasing power. Um, so that might be the most attractive factor for foreign investors. And on top of that, Indonesia also um, benefits from a very strategic geographic location. It's um, tucked between its ASEAN neighbors like Singapore, Malaysia and Philippines. And uh, it's also very close to Australia and the South uh, and right at one of the most um, important shipping lanes in the world, the Strait of Malacca. Um, also, Indonesia is part of uh, bilateral trade agreements as well as uh, free trade agreements through its ASEAN membership. Um, some of our ASEAN free trade, agreement, free trade agreements are uh, with Australia, China, Hong Kong, uh, India, Japan, South Korea, and uh, also New Zealand. And then there's also uh, the big ones like uh, RCEP, the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership. Um, which we did a few webinars on, by the way, uh, which also includes um, China, for example, and also the Indo-Pacific Framework, IPEF, which uh, has the US and India participating. So RCEP and IPEF are the two largest trade deals in the world, each encompassing, I think, for more than a third of the world's population and also more of a third of the world's, uh, of a global GDP. So, so these are the largest uh, trade deals. Uh, and also, lastly, I think Indonesia is currently uh, negotiating uh, several FTAs as well, uh, one with the European Union uh, and also one uh, with Turkey. So overall, we can see uh, more attractiveness uh, through this uh, enhanced engagement with the global economy. Those RCEP webinars, by the way, were, were really strong. Uh, had a good look at those. Given its rapidly uh, growing sectors, large emerging market, uh, attracting international companies, can you tell us a little more about Dizanshira's team and its services specializations there on the ground in Indonesia? Sure, and, and, and happy to. So we're, we have been in Indonesia not for as long as we've been uh, to Vietnam, but uh, I think the growth uh, projected for uh, our Indonesia office is is uh, quite large there. Uh, we have a great team there uh, that I'm working with on a daily basis. So in Jakarta, uh, we have uh, our colleague Jennifer, who takes care of uh, the advisory unit. Uh, also in Jakarta, we have sitting uh, our colleague uh, Samara, which is taking care of our business intelligence uh, services there. And we have an editor sitting with us for ASEAN briefing, um, who's uploading and, of course, writing and researching uh, regular updates, regulatory updates, uh, macroeconomic updates, uh, which you can find at ASEANbriefing.com, uh, as well as, uh, and in Jakarta, we also have accounting, legal and HR professionals. But then we also have a second office in Indonesia, which is in Batam. Perhaps not too many of you have heard of Batam before, but uh, that's an Indonesian island, just 40 minutes by ferry away from Singapore. Uh, very strategic location again. Uh, last time we had dinner there with a colleagues, we could look at Marina Bay Sands from the restaurant, even though we were in Indonesia. Uh, so you can see how close it is. And uh, there we also have uh, uh, 10 people sitting um, who uh, not only support our Indonesia operations, but also part of our Singapore operations. So uh, all in all in Indonesia, we can help with, um, I think, five key services. The first one, which I mentioned before, Samara, BI, Business Intelligence, 
uh, they typically help our clients with market research, entry and feasibility studies, product or competitor analysis, or even country comparisons if you're not quite sure where to diversify or enter yet in Southeast Asia. Uh, then the second part would be our legal services, which uh, helps our clients who already decided, hey, we want to move to uh, Indonesia or to Jakarta. Then we can help with incorporation, corporate restructuring, contract draftings and reviews. And then we do help with uh, ongoing uh, compliance services so that our client can focus on the business and we take care of the paperwork, uh, which includes accounting, so bookkeeping, tax filing, tax advisory and audits, things of that nature. And also HR, the fourth point, which includes payroll, HR administration. Uh, and uh, lastly, we also do offer IT services, not just hardware setups, but also software implementations. But one important thing I want to mention, which is always coming up with calls uh, with our clients in Indonesia, and that is that Indonesia uh, has quite high capital uh, requirements for foreign investors. And for that, we also do offer a quite smart solution to our clients. If our client is not yet sure whether to set up in Indonesia or not, or has one or two employees and wants to explore the market first, we can hire that employee on behalf of the client under our own entity. We have a license for that, and they can work under DSA Indonesia, uh, and but directly report to the uh, headquarter of the client, of course, and, and then the market can be explored and initial business uh, can be uh, discovered there. Sounds like a really smart solution. You mentioned Jennifer and you mentioned uh, Ayman. Uh, we'll, we'll actually be speaking to them as well as part of this clip. Um, thank you very much, Mark, with these uh, enlightening facts about the Indonesia market today. Thanks so much for having me. Joining us is ASEAN Briefing Senior Editor based in Jakarta, Ayman Falak, to discuss country infrastructure and an interesting capital city relocation plan set for 2024. Thanks for joining us, Amy. Given the ongoing supply chain challenges that countries face globally, coupled with increased demand from rapid growth in Indonesia, how well situated is the country's development outlook and its infrastructure capacity? Well, Indonesia has suffered from a lack of infrastructure investments for, for a while now. Um, <clears throat> We, but only it's, it's only uh, President uh, Joko Widodo who's really pushed uh, in, infrastructure as, as the backbone of the economy. So he's opened up uh, around four hundred billion dollars worth of infrastructure projects, uh, open to foreign investors. Uh, we're looking to develop more than twenty-five new airports, thousands of kilometers of highways, uh, ports, um, power stations, um, and um, among others. So Indonesia, you know, we've had the, the highest logistics costs in ASEAN, 24% of GDP. Uh, we're looking to decrease that to 70% and eventually 15% to make it business more uh, competitive. And um, it's, it's really needed since, you know, I think even uh, sending packages between Indonesian islands, sometimes it can be more expensive than, than importing, you know, a package from, from Europe. So for Indonesia, uh, infrastructure development is, is key uh, if it wants to move out of this middle income trap and uh, add value to its industries. Switching now to Indonesian, uh, the Indonesian government's plans to move its capital uh, from Jakarta to lesser known Nusantara, or is it Nusantara? Nusantara. All right. Uh, which is in the Borneo jungle, I believe. Right. Uh, can you share your views on why this is being done and what effects, if any, this may have on the uh, economy and the ease of doing business for international firms? Well, it's, it's no secret that Jakarta has been suffering from the constraints of urbanization, overpopulation. It's a mega city of more than 30 million people, and it's actually a sinking city. So a lot of uh, residential and commercial businesses here use groundwater for their water supplies. So over the decades, the city is slowly sinking, and that's uh, resulted in a lot of flooding, um, and uh, worsening traffic jams. I think uh, tra traffic jams alone cost the economy for over $4 billion a year. So with Nusantara in, in East Kalimantan province, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a brand new slate for foreign investors. It's, um, it's, it's been in the plan since, since the 1960s actually to move the capital. It's only been in the, implemented now. 
So it's it's not the area is not prone to um, uh, earthquakes, tsunamis, and so forth. Uh, so for the government, they're looking for investments in smart cities, uh, security, energy, uh, construction. It's a blank slate. It's it's also I think for businesses they should look at this as, a, as an ambitious project from, from Indonesia because there have been examples of where governments in, in Southeast Asia have moved their capital city and it's not worked out. But for, for Indonesia, I think it's slightly different. Uh, even the steering committee itself is composed of uh, former Prime Minister Tony Blair, uh, UAE President uh, Sheikh Mohammed bin Zayed, and um, Indonesia itself, is, uh, they've uh, received uh, uh, funding from the UAE of over ten billion dollars for the for the new capital, so it's really a clean a clean slate, and um, even seventy five percent of the new capital will be green spaces, and so it's uh, for for the future of uh, but it's, it's it's only going to be an administ administrative capital. Jakarta itself will continue to be the business hub of Indonesia, the financial hub of Indonesia. Twenty percent of GDP is still in in Jakarta itself of a country's GDP. And the government is not going to sort of abandon Jakarta in a way. It's, um, you know, billions of dollars is still going to be pumped into uh, infrastructure, uh, water, um, water supply treatment, um, transport, uh, that's critical transport, because uh, Greater Jakarta is, is, is now sort of engulfing two other provinces. So uh, for Jakarta itself, it's, uh, it's still going to continue to be the business and financial hub of, of Indonesia. Thank you. It's not something you hear about uh, every day, uh, a, a country moving its capital, but uh, it sounds like it's being done for very good reasons. And clearly these developments will present not only a great opportunity for business investors uh, to come into the country, but also marks an important shift in its continuing strong growth in the country. Thank you very much, Eamon. Uh, it was short, but it was a pleasure having you. Thank you, Gary. Welcome, Jennifer, and thanks for joining today. Other segments in this clip have explored Indonesia's strategic importance, its economy, infrastructure, and about Desan Shira's presence on the ground. Building on this, as Desan Shira's international business advisor based in Jakarta, can you share some insights about some of Indonesia's key and trending sectors? Well, thank you for the question, Gary, and thank you for having me. Aside from the fast agricultural sector, manufacturing has grown exponentially in recent years, accounting for almost a quarter of the country's GDP. Recently, exactly just two days ago, Indonesia's Minister of Investment has just announced that foreign direct investment into Indonesia, excluding investment in banking and the oil and gas sectors, has accelerated to a new record high in quarter two 2022, with FDI amounting to 10.89 billion US dollars. Basic metal, metal goods, non-machinery, and equipment industries set investment in the second quarter with 3.2 billion US dollar, followed by the mining sector, housing, industrial estates, and office sector. Mineral fuels, including oil, are still listed as the top export product, while machinery, including computers, is listed as the top import product. Indonesia is home to the world's largest nickel reserves, the second largest producer of tin, the third largest producer of coal, and the fifth largest producer of bauxite. And this reflects how commodities are still of huge importance to the economy, where Indonesia hopes for greater investments in its downstream industries, particularly in commodities processing. With several policies in place, Indonesia aims to attract more foreign investors to establish their manufacturing units and process commodities within the country. Lastly, uh, Gary, with Indonesia's G20 presidency, part of the issues involving sectors related to global health ar architecture, digital transformation, and also sustainable energy transition should also be anticipated. Those are some uh, very, very um, big numbers uh, coming out of Indonesia. For companies seeking to enter these sectors or the wider market, could you introduce what ease of doing business and operating in regulatory environments uh, international investors could expect in the market? Yeah, sure. Um, I say in the past, any businesses in Indonesia were required to obtain one or more of licenses to operate. 
and to obtain such licenses, the process involves multi-layer institutions from the regional to the central government. Uh, it was a challenge for foreign businesses to know what business license to obtain and where to get them. Recently, uh, the government of Indonesia has made various attempts to facilitate the ease of doing business in the country, one of which is the processing of business licensing through the so-called online single submission system. In November 2020, Indonesia had one of the biggest regulatory reforms since 1998 through the issues of the omnibus law. The law amends over 70 existing laws with the primary aim of stimulating domestic and foreign investment by simplifying business licensing requirements, liberalizing industries, and streamlining labor laws. One of the most significant changes that have been made regarding FDI, aside from the issuance of the positive investment list, which eliminates major restrictions for foreign investors, was the shifting from the previous business licensing regime to a risk-based approach, classifying businesses into four types of risk, low, medium-low, medium-high, and high risk. And among the four classifications of risk, only businesses that are classified as medium, high, and high risk will be required to process their verification of certificate of standard and are licensed to the relevant ministries and institutions. Therefore, uh, through this new business licensing regime and other simplification of business licensing requirements, uh, we really hope Indonesia hopes to cut the rate tape and boost its ease of doing business rank in the world. So I say uh, this is the right time for you to invest. Sounds like a great time to get active in one of ASEAN's giants. Um, thank you very much, Jennifer. This has been uh, very, very informative and it's been a pleasure to have you. Thank you, Gary.